attendees are in Hi, good evening. Welcome to the but the school or and didn't need you fast. First item on our agenda this evening is, a, is that time of the year where we get to recognize some outstanding students who, uh, who live here in the village of Royal Palm Beach and are attending high school, uh, various high schools in the area. Um, I'm going to take a moment, though, just to plug the, an event that comes up on July 4th. It's the Mayor's Golf Tournament. I'd love to have you all participate, put teams out there. But the, the point why I'm bringing it up is the, whatever uh, revenues we get out of the Mayor's Golf Tournament is dedicated to supporting the, the scholarships that we hand out. Now, we will budget the funds whether or not we get anything from the, <laughs> from the, from the, uh, the golf tournament, but that is what the funds that come in for the golf tournament are designated for is to support our scholarship program for the, the wonderful students we have out there. <laughs> So with that, are you ready? I am. Okay, let's let's begin. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Councilman Homera, who is the uh, liaison to our Education Advisory Board and is behind helping making sure all of these things get happened. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and welcome everybody. Uh, this is a really special, a special time of the year for, especially for the graduates, no doubt about it, and their families. Lots to be proud of, and we're proud of the fact that we have such outstanding. Uh, graduating seniors here in, in Royal Palm Beach. One of the favorite activities I think that the Education Advisory Board gets involved in is the uh, actual interview process because it really generates a lot of hope for the future. And uh, quite frankly, it's, it's just amazing to listen to these graduates talk about their vision and what they're planning. Uh, and it's, it's, it's also an opportunity to thank some volunteers for the community. Our Education Advisory Board is made up of six members. We're fortunate to have three of them here this evening. Uh, and um, they're going to help us out with, with this uh, by reading the uh, biographies for each of the recipients of the scholarship as I, I read their names. Uh, just want to start off and, and thank uh, our chairwoman, uh, Jennifer Sullivan, who has done an absolutely outstanding job this year. Uh, she's taken it to another level. And uh, all I can say is, Next year, chairperson, you got some big shoes to fill here. But the good news is she's there and she'll help, I'm sure. And, and we also have uh, two members. Uh, we have Paula Wilson, uh, who is with us this evening, and also Nancy Panea. We are fortunate to have all three of them. And the other three, uh, even the newest member, brings a tremendous amount of expertise and, and passion for education. And of course, that's such a key function here in, in, in Royal Palm Beach. So uh, with that said, I will invite them to go ahead and, um, well, you can step up when I mention the name if we do it, do it that way. And of course, the mayor gets to do the most fun part, uh, and that is uh, provide the checks. So, so with that, with that uh, uh, idea about uh, how we're going to do this evening, let me start off with uh, the first of $10,000 scholarship uh, award recipients, and that would be Sarah Ahmed. I have all I have the first four so I'll stay up here and read their bios okay sounds okay. good I was born to a Palestinian Palestinian Florida candidate at Royal Park she is secretary of the university basketball she prides herself fluently and 
legislation, Sarah. Recipient is. Anjana is a. At Florida. Her Associate of Arts degree, and she plans on attending the University of Florida to study biology. Congratulations, Sanjana. Our next recipient is Chloe Carpenter. Chloe is a senior graduating from Royal Palm Beach Community High School and is a student in the International Baccalaureate program. She plans to attend the, univers the University of Central Florida in the summer, where she will major in biology in a pre-medicine track. Chloe's ultimate goal is to become an anesthesiologist. Congratulations. Our next recipient is Samuel Dorcellus Sotel. Was, was I close? Sam Sammy is a senior attending Royal Palm Beach High School and currently dual enrolled at Palm Beach State College. He is an advanced placement scholar as well as a Florida Medallion Scholar, graduating within the top 3% of his class. While participating in Academic Games Leagues of America, he placed 5th in the state and 4th at Nationals. He was one of the captains of the boys varsity soccer team, which won the District 11 7A title. He will be attending FAU this fall and will transfer to UF to major in civil engineering. Congratulations, Sammy. Can I give, can I give you a Our next recipient is Daphna Edward. Daphna moved to the United States in 2010 and has had a chance to experience numerous opportunities here. She has made connections with people that are close enough to be family. Living in the Sunshine State, she has grown to love the beaches, the theme parks, and the warm weather all year long. Despite the positives, she has experienced some setbacks, but she is grateful for them as she has learned from her mistakes to better herself for the future. As she steps out into adulthood, she hopes to achieve her long-term goal of being a dentist. When she steps on that FAU campus next year, she can't wait for the experiences and challenges that lie ahead. Our next recipient is Adante Jakusik. Adante Jakusik is a senior at Royal Palm Beach High School. He is a Florida academic scholar and has been recently named to the part-time president's list at Palm Beach State College. While playing high school soccer, he was named to back-to-back first-team Palm Beach All-County teams for the 2021-22 and 2022-23 seasons. They won District 11-7A this past season. He currently plays semi-professional soccer. Adante plans on attending FAU this fall and is going to major in electrical engineering. Good for you. is Brun was Mall Ridge High School. Robert plans to in field. Is Sophia Madden. Sophia Florida. She loves has been interested of ornithology. And so And our next recipient is Kaya Stegel.
Kaya is 18 years old and will be graduating as a senior at Berrien Christian School on May 19th. She will be attending Florida Gulf Coast University in the fall and will be studying and getting her degree in computer science and one day will become a web developer. Kaya participated in numerous musicals at her school and held many principal roles such as Young Kangaroo in Susicle, Jetsam in The Little Mermaid, and more. She would like to thank the village of Royal Palm Beach for this award. Finally, she would like to thank her family for their unconditional support towards her. And as I say, not last, last but not least, certainly, is our final recipient, Jana Wallace. Jana Wallace is graduating from Seminole Ridge High School. She was a member of the Varsity Swim Team, National Honor Society, ASL Honor Society, and served as secretary on the executive board of the Student Government Association. She will continue her studies at Florida Gulf Coast University as a psychology major and plans to minor in ASL interpreting. Jana's ASL teacher inspired her to follow her career path to become a speech pathologist. She plans on attending graduate school after earning her bachelor's degree. Jana wants to spark a change in the world and help people achieve their goals. Janet enjoys working as a lifeguard and swim instructor in her spare time at Calypso Bay Water Park. She also enjoys swimming, going to the beach, and attending concerts. Great. Congratulations. I wonder, I wonder if we get, get everybody to come on up in front and take a large group picture, including the Education Advisory Board members, council, mayor, recipients. Let's see what we can do. Hey, you know, I just want to point out not one of those kids chose 
FSU or the U, they all were going to the Gatorland. So. They were all going to FAU first. Now, now, let's not get into that. <laughs> Spoil an otherwise pleasant activity. We'll we'll give it we'll we'll see. <laughs> we'll take a few minutes and give the parents and the, and, the, and the beautiful young children a chance to leave the uh, village hall here. But I just want to do a shout out. Let's give a hand again to these wonderful, wonderful young people. They're just outstanding. With all, with all the turmoil going on in our world today, is it's really refresh, reassuring and refreshing to see such talented youngsters moving out into the world, and they will be our future leaders. I'm certain of that. So thank you. Okay, we're going to reconvene our meeting at this time. And the first item on the agenda is, is a proclamation for public works. Where's Paul Webster? Is, Paul, Paul, are you here or are you online? He's online. Okay. <laughs> well, we do this every year because Paul reminds us that we need to do this. So that's why I wonder where he was. <laughs> okay. This is a proclamation, and whereas public work services provide, provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support, of, the support of and the understanding an informed citizen is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems, programs, such as water, sewers, streets, highways, public buildings, and solid waste collection. And whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities, as well as their planning, design, and construction, is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials. And whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, on this day, Royal Palm Beach to do the first two works week. And I call themselves our public works. Make every day sign and see us who've experienced that were mentioned here in the proclamation. I think we would agree. We take it for granted until there's a problem, <laughs> and then we want somebody to come out and get it fixed for us and get the water turned back on or get the flooding from stopping those kind of things. Um, so we appreciate that we take a time out during the year to acknowledge the importance of our public works initiatives and people who support that. Okay, with that, we'll take reports. And you want to open up with a report, Jeff, on uh, the meeting that we didn't go to? No? No. Okay. <laughs> with, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it it wouldn't be, be a real more. short report. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so we'll start with you, Jen. Okay, good evening, okay. everyone. Um, first, uh, congratulations to CAFSI. For another wonderful cultural Just diversity, cultural diversity day. day. Yeah, it was uh -huh. good. Um, you, you guys missed the Saturday. song, right? You, you missed the song. Did you catch it? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Which song? You missed it. <laughs> the steel drums were fantastic. Um, and May is Mental Health Awareness. It's um, it's always important to remind our folks that if anyone's in crisis, we have quick available numbers to um, access. 211 is the helpline, and 988 is the new uh, crisis line and, and con um, suicide prevention line. And then um, June 5th kicks off the summer reading program at our Royal Palm Beach Library, and it's not just for kids anymore. So they have teen programs and adult programs. Um, yeah, so that's my report, Mayor. Okay. You like that. 
so we had our last education advisory board meeting uh, about two weeks ago and um, that closes out the 2022-23 school year uh, and of course the graduations are coming up uh, and um, that's a really exciting time uh, along with handing out scholarships primary focus though of that meeting was uh, a report from the school district about the legislation that's impacting the schools and if you read any of the newspapers about any of that, you know it's pretty significant. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the presenters characterized uh, the results of this legislative session as changing the landscape of education in Florida. So there are a lot of things, and I, I've got to tell you that I'm really impressed with the very positive attitude that, that we saw across the board, and I think it's sincere. Uh, dealing with some of these really challenging activities uh, that the uh, state legislature um, enacted uh, this this year uh, just a couple of examples uh, one of them you probably heard about the universal school vouchers uh, which will allow um, individual parents to decide to expend a per student funding from the state on uh, either public private charter virtual and home schools uh, so it it that in and of itself uh, is is an interesting uh, change in the landscape um, they also, um, the legislature also imp uh, implemented or a actually put into law uh, a change in start times for schools and eliminating staggered start times. So that, speaking of challenges, from the point of view of school buses, drivers, all of that, uh, some really challenging kinds of um, things embedded in just changing start times. When, when does that take effect, do you know? I, I don't know for sure. 2026. What is Twenty twenty five. She said twenty twenty six. They okay. have a lot of time to plan. Huh? And and they're going to need that time for sure. <laughs> so um, there's also an impact on uh, teachers unions from some of the uh, legislation. Uh, an interesting one is cell phones in the classroom. Um, could be a good thing. Unfortunately, it has a, the nickname of the TikTok bill. Uh, so not sure exactly how that's going to play out. But classroom safety is one of the significant uh, considerations as always, but now we have legislation which is going to put into place some uh, private space considerations. All of this is to really be sorted out, and uh, it's, it is going to take some time. Uh, the school district, though, is leaning into it, and they're taking on the challenges and looking certainly at the opportunities that those uh, will present. Um, we, uh, of course, like I said, have the uh, Royal Palm Beach High School graduation coming up on the 24th of this month, 1 p.m., uh, this class has really done an outstanding job. They've set a number of records in a number of different uh, places and have, um, will continue to, to raise the level of the performance and, and the reputation of, of Royal Palm Beach High School, I'm sure. So um, I, I do have to say that one of the pleasures of being associated with the Education Advisory Board is you get to spend some time uh, with the president of each year's student council. And each one of them is just remarkable in their own different way. Um, the, the young man, uh, Javier Rivas, was uh, this year's student council president. His energy level was infectious. It really was. You couldn't sit next to him without being excited. <laughs> Didn't matter what he was saying. He was just so excited about it. And, and you could see why he makes such a great leader. So um, again, um, we, um, we had a good last meeting. Look forward to next year. A lot of things to be dealt with coming years, that's for sure. That completes my my report. Okay. Thank you. Um, on Tuesday, I think it was of this week, I attended the Central Palm Beach Chamber uh, of Commerce. They had uh, basically at least my representative and my senator and, and local um, representatives and senators to uh, give a report or update on the legislative session and not as much as the school stuff as Jeff said, but one of the ones that got my attention, and I think it was in the report from our lobbyist, uh, I don't know exactly what it was, but it seemed like it could be a problem with our inability to zone certain things. I think they might have said in commercial or uh, industrial areas, if they want to build houses or something like that where they can build really big things that aren't allowed by your local laws, yet that could be questionable now. Oh, 
the Live Local Act. But that was it, Live Local. Right. And it, it deals with affordable housing, and it allows um, certain affordable housing developments that have to uh, have certain percentages of affordable housing. And affordable is, is defined um, as a function of the mortgage or the rent payment relationship to the household gross income and whether it's um, very low uh, or low or, or, or moderate and then I think the affordable housing element has to be in place for at least 30 years but if you meet all of these criteria that developers as you say in a mixed-use zone or an industrial or commercial zone can develop affordable housing um, developments with, without even having to go through a public hearing process, it's essentially uh, administratively approved. Um, so, but that is the so local, it was something to be as concerned the about the alarm bells going off when I heard them uh, and talk that about one it. That got um, across the board bipartisan support at the legislature. It was uh, supported across the board, and it was signed into law. One of the very first bills that was signed into law this session. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Keith. Thank you. If you could, you get with uh, with the manager and <coughs> just kind of summarize, put a summary together that you can come back to us with. We actually um, did, I okay. but we will be we can be prepared to uh, give you a, a verbal rundown on that at your next council meeting on the yeah, and uh, high and the low points for sure and, 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 and the impact on us. Where we might be vulnerable yes. and maybe some thoughts on what we need to do to protect the quality of life in our building. Absolutely. Okay. Good. My understanding is it could be it could be a mixed use development, uh, and if it is, then it, I, don't, I don't remember the percentage, but a certain percentage has to be affordable housing. But I believe the entire project could be affordable housing. Okay, as good, well. okay. that's my the goal is, is to make it easier to build affordable housing in Florida. That that is that is the goal of, of that legislation. Okay, that was it, Mr. Mayor. Good. Good evening, everyone, and congratulations to all the students out there. We joke that when I met with the village manager, we joke around about is that today is the, the make you feel inadequate day. <laughs> they, they've done more in, in their 18 years than I have in, you know, uh, four times that. So congratulations to all of them. Um, we did have our citizen summit, so thank you, everybody, for showing up for that. And it really uh, helps us plan as we go forward. So thank you very much to the the citizens who came out, the residents, um, everyone who participated in it. We attended the Cool Runnings grand opening, so now we have an ice cream place in Veterans Park across from Seeds Cafe, so it's really nice um, that they complement each other and that they're open over there. And then we all did attend C Cultural Diversity Day as well. Um, there is a new playground structure at Veterans Park also, so we tested that out. It is, is um, for a little bit older children than the other one was. I do miss the dinosaur slash alligator, but it's beautiful, um, and there's a lot more activity to it and everything. So they redid that whole area. Yeah, I've gotten feedback from young people that they'd like to see big, bigger swings for bigger kids. It is because they just have the smaller ones they over there. They have the smaller ones, Right, yeah. but I think because a lot of the apparatus stuff there is for the older kids that – that that's why, and it's a small space, but they redid the um, AstroTurf and everything. They really like the turf. Yeah, it, yeah. it came out very nice. Um, there are also new shade structures at Todd Robner Park and Preservation Park Playground, so it's great when you're hanging out there uh, from the sun, light rain, it's beautiful. Um, there are new electronic message boards around the village, so they've all been replaced. You can see the difference then that they're easier to read from further away, very colorful. Uh, so please check those out so you can find out everything else that's going on. We have a food truck and concert tomorrow night. It, there is a Billy Joel uh, tribute band playing at 5 o'clock at Commons Park. We have a seniors prom. 55 plus or And that is on. That's not senior 50 plus, no. Do you take advantage not, of the not, discount? Not, not nowadays, it's not, right? Take my discount, friend. Yeah, do take my. <laughs> don't, don't take it. Do you personal. go for the early bird special at Denny's? I know. It's. <laughs> Okay. So uh, it's Whatever. on the Friday the 26th over at the Cultural Center. And just for you, Mayor, the what? time is from 3 to 7. So you're still in bed early. <laughs> uh, we do have a couple of camps coming up also for the summer basketball camp. Uh, that's for ages 6 to 14, and that is from May 30th to June 2nd. 
There's a sand volleyball camp Mondays and Wednesdays from 5.30 to 7.30 starting June 5th. Indoor volleyball camps uh, May 30th through June 2nd and then also in July. And then the Early Childhood Adventures Summer Camp is for um, children from three to five. So they have that available. And um, all of our slots at our camp for the Royal Palm Beach Camp have been filled. So they are sold out. So it's great that we're now past where we were before in the last couple of years. So good for them. And then everything can be found on our website, royalpalmbeachfl.gov. Thank you. That's great. No report, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, this, I know we got some feedback on the state legislator and some things that we're looking to do. I think we should we should talk about it until maybe it gets beyond the veto, line line item veto. Did we, we submitted a uh, sort of an interim memo that, that shows what made it through the legislature right. and whether it's been signed or if it's still sitting on the governor's desk still waiting okay. to be presented. But yes, that that, that, up, that well, memo will be finalized. At, once we've we been here through. before. Hopefully yes. this time maybe we get across the finish line. So, so, uh, okay. And then we'll be uh, – prepared to give you a verbal uh, okay. on, on the highlights and the lowlights at, at your next council meeting as well. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. So I guess that concludes the report at this time. Um, does anyone have a petition they'd like to present to the council? Now would be the time to do that. Seeing none, I'm going to close the floor on petitions for the rest of the evening. Um, Diane, do we have any advanced statements from the public on items not on the agenda or items on the consent agenda? No, Mayor. Ray, we have any hands raised? <laughs> items not on the agenda or items on the consent agenda? No, Mayor. Don't you get lonely with that a little bit? Well, they're here. You're here? Okay. <laughs> but this, they're just not raising their hands. Okay, that's fine. I have not received any comment cards from anyone on items not on the agenda or items on the consent agenda, but if anyone here would like to comment, I'll give you that opportunity. Seeing none. And I'm going to close the floor to items not on the agenda and items on the consent agenda. And with that, Diane, please give us the consent agenda. Yes, Mayor. Well, thank you. Uh, number one, approval of the minutes of the council regular meeting of April 20th, 2023. Two, approval to purchase fireworks and pyrotechnician services from Zambali Fireworks Manufacturing Company for the annual display at the July 4th celebration being held at Royal Palm Beach Commons Park in the amount of $50,000 with such purchase being in accordance with procurement guidelines set forth in the Village Code subsection 10-98D. Three, approval of a special event permit for Southern 441 Nissan to hold a sales event on Saturday, May 29th, from 11 approval of a special event permit for Star Spangled at Royal 2023 from 1 p.m. until 10 p.m. 5. Approval and adoption of resolution number 2315, a resolution of the Village Council of the Village of Royal Palm Beach, Florida, authorizing the mayor to execute amendment 002 to the interlocal cooperation agreement with Palm Beach County concerning the village's participation in the urban county program related to the administration of funds from the Community Development Block Grant and Home Investment Partnership Program during federal fiscal years 2024 through 2026, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Six, approval and authorization for the village manager to enter into agreement with Texas Aquatic Harvesting Incorporated for harvesting services to remove floating vegetative debris from the village canal system by piggybacking the South Florida Water Management District, contract number 460000 Four six nine four for mechanical harvesting. Okay. Any comments, questions from members on council on the consent agenda? If there are none, I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, let the record show that the consent agenda was approved 5 0. We'll move now to the regular agenda, regular agenda item R1. is the presentation, our annual presentation, uh, from Palm Beach County Sheriff uh, Office District 9, and our own very, our very own Captain uh, Nayox will give us that update uh, on how things are going. So, Diane, you want to start the preview buzzer? <laughs> I'll get it by 255, we'll be done. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Village Council, Manager, I once again want to thank you very much for allowing me to participate. <coughs>
29th Annual Report. Um, on behalf of Sheriff Bradshaw, we're very proud to continue the relationship we have with the Village of Royal Palm Beach. Um, this will mark my 10th year, believe it or not, involved in the presentation of the reports with you guys. Um, first with Captain years. Miles, wow. and then myself. Yeah, I got five more left to go, and and that's it. What, you only allow 15 years? No, that'll give me, I'll be 60 by the time I'm done. That'll give me just about 41 years in law enforcement. And but you know what they say, 60 is the new 40, but we well, won't I, go there, right? I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate that. And uh, before we begin, I'd also like to introduce our criminal intelligence analyst, Harry Hook. He helps, uh, that's not solely responsible for the presentation of the book and the numbers and, and all the crunches. So if you have any questions I can't answer, I'll be happy to pull him up here and, and go ahead and present. Okay. Moving forward. <coughs> I brought him here. I'm familiar with my computer, not this one. Right. <laughs> community outreach. At District 9, we believe in the importance of community involvement. As such, some of the activities we're involved in include Christ Fellowship Appreciation Day, Annual pr Principals Breakfast, Bike Helms Program, Holiday Stuffed Animal Program with PetSmart, Shop of the Cop, Easter Bunny Inc., Truck or Treat, and Feeding South Florida, as well as many others. District 9 Citizen Observer Patrol. District 9 um, Observer Patrol, as you know, is an integral part of the district. Uh, every year we recognize the, the top volunteer. We have a, a, a luncheon for them. You'll all come, and, and we greatly appreciate what they do for us. Um, here we have illustrated some of the statistics that they pro provide free of charge to the village, um, such as 762 volunteer hours. Um, we have 20 active members. They patrolled 4,011 miles, conducted 338 park patrols, um, 31,947 business checks. And if you take all those times together and add them, um, the total value of 762 volunteer hours equates to $22,821. District 9 support statistics. Bicycle equipped deputies provided 347 hours of patrol. Mounted unit provided 26 patrol hours. Deputies provided 35 hours of marine patrol in the village. Fingerprint services processed 100, excuse me, 1,343 requests for fingerprinting. District 9 ARU specialists handled 146 calls with 96 case numbers pulled. And the lobby processed 140, excuse me, 126 pounds of unwanted prescriptions. Calls for service. Calls for service depict the number of calls that the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office receives from residents in the village. They're monitored through something called CADS. And what CADS does is tells us where we are, what we're doing. And it also gives us a total number. For example, you'll see here that we have 102,594 CADS incidents. Those are incidents that occurred in the village of Royal Palm Beach. Of those 102,594 incidents, 19,461 were calls for service from the public. The remaining 83,133 were other calls, such as traffic stops, broken down vehicles, vehicle checks, checking out suspicious persons, uh, traffic accidents, things of the like, things that normally wouldn't generate a case number. Um, in 2022, we had 7,965 more CADS incidents than we had in 2021. However, we had 473 less calls for service than 2021. So calls for service decreased by 2%. And let me go ahead and explain a little bit what we have here, if you don't mind. Um, as a commander, I would hope that when calls from the service, from the public, go down, our proactivity would go up. In other words, we're spending less time helping the public, so we should be interacting with people in other ways, whether it be pushing cars out of the road or doing business checks or traffic stops or whatever. So if I'm low on one end, I look for an increase on the other end. Here you can see that while calls for service were down, the deputies were more active almost 8,000 times than they were the year before. Did everybody understand that or I confuse that a little? No. Mm -hmm. All right, UCR statistical comparison. This is the meat and potatoes of our report. The UCR, it does so by taking murder, Robert, larceny, brief breakdown on some 
there were no murders in the village of Royal Palm Beach in 2022. Forcible rape, also known as sexual battery. There were six sexual battery cases investigated in District 9 in 2021 and 18 in 2022, an increase of 200%. All of the sexual battery cases involved twins. Robbery, there were two in 2021 and six in 2022, an increase of 200%. Aggravated assault, there were 52 in 2021 and 58 in 2022 for an increase of 11.5%. Now, noteworthy in this crime is the fact that one act of aggravated assault can have multiple victims. So in other words, let's say there's a road rage incident and someone points at a car, let's give me a gun at a, at a car with five people in it. Right then and there, if they saw it and they felt as if their life was in danger, you will have five victims of an aggravated assault under one case. Having explained that, of the aggravated assault numbers I just explained, 25 were domestic related, two were against law enforcement officers, seven were road rage incidents, 19 were acquaintance related, and one incident had five victims, and another two had, um, excuse me, and two victims each were five were strangers. Burglary, there were 18 in 2021 and 19 in 2022, an increase of 5.6%. Larceny, this also includes auto burglary, there were 416 in 2021 and 458 in 2022, an increase of 10.1%. Motor vehicle theft, there were 26 in 2021 and 26 in 2022. There was no change in this category. Unfortunately, the details that I just described above caused the crime, total crime index to rise from 523 in 2021 to 585 in 2022. This resulted in a crime rate of 11.9%. In a moment, I'll elaborate on some of the other crimes, but what I want to do is put things into perspective now for the audience, for the council, and the mayor. If you look here, I included a 10-year index. As you can see, our total crime index in the Village of Royal Palm Beach is 1,103 in 2013. It has incrementally climbed down over the years to where we're at today, 585, only up a little bit from last year. Noteworthy of the fact is that the crime is up post-COVID, but it's not at pre-COVID level. Robbery incidents. Of the previously mentioned six robberies, all were snatch and grab. Some of them involved school children. So we had some incidents where a kid was walking on his way home from um, Royal Palm Beach High School. Um, two kids jumped out, grabbed a wallet or a cell phone or something like that. Um, six arrests were made of suspects involved in three of the robbery cases. In other words, to confuse that, some cases had more than one suspect involved in the robbery. Larceny incidents. There were 416 reported larcenies in 2021 and 458 in 2022. Of the 416 larcenies, 181 were shoplifting cases. That number rose from 144 in 2021 for an increase of 25.7%. Out of the shoplifting incidents, 37 occurred at Target, 17 at Walmart, 27 at Lowe's. Those shoplifting cases accounted for 55.8% of all shoplifting cases. Larceny incidents, as I previously mentioned, also include auto burglaries. I'll touch on those in a second. Captain, can I ask yes. you real quick? I'm sorry to interrupt. Going back to the shoplifting cases, are those the one? and it's not right either way, but are those ones where it's a small, here's one item, two items, or I'm going to blatantly take this whole shelf and walk out and no one's going to stop me? It involves both. Both, okay. It involves push-outs, which have become a lot more frequent. Um, where people just grab a shopping cart and just push it right out through the door. Sometimes when they're confronted, they'll abandon it, but the crime's already been committed. Sometimes they'll just go about their way. There's an awful lot of liability involved in store security for them to try and apprehend them if somebody gets hurt. So more often than not, it's a slightly delayed or, in some cases, a very delayed call for service. You're very welcome. Residential burglary incidents. In 2021, there were eight. In 2022, there were 11. This resulted in a 38% increase in this category. Of those eight, three were domestic acquaintance related, one was suspicious in nature, two were to vacant homes, and in four cases, patios or open areas were entered, and in one, the garage was left open. So as I stated in previous years, people think of residential burglary as someone prying open the front door or going in, or someone breaking a window and opening up the window and crawling in. It's not, it doesn't have to be that. Florida State statute says to enter or remain within a Structure of conveyance to commit a crime you're in. If your garage door is open, someone goes inside, grabs your lawnmower, takes it out, it's a burglary. 
That being said, from 2018 to 2022, in the village of Royal Palm Beach, residential burglaries decreased by 31%. Vehicle burglaries, this is always our fun one. <laughs> there were 125 vehicle burglaries in 2021 and 96 in 2022. Fortunately, that resulted in a decrease of 23.2%. Vehicle burglaries accounted for 96 of the 458 reported losses. Of those 96 vehicle burglaries, 69 or 71.87% were the vehicles that were left unlocked. 14 firearms were taken in those burglaries, and 11 out of those 14, those vehicles were locked, left unlocked as well. Additionally, there were 25 auto thefts in 2021 and 26 in 2022, an increase of 4%. Of those 26 thefts, 16 or 62% involved keys that were left in the vehicle. Of the remainder, some were acquaintance related or stem from reports filed by dealerships or car rental agencies. We're starting to see a lot more of that lately with some of our car rental places. Someone will rent the car, they don't bring it back. They send them a certified letter, they don't respond to the certified letter. They'll call us, report it stolen. Most often when we recover it, they abandon charges. Is that correct, Harry? They refuse prosecution and then it's just, it's a crime that will never have an arrest for. What, why do they refuse prosecution? I guess there's just too much they time involved in it. To I can't speak for them. Mayor, I know in the past, historically, when I was a detective, a lot of times the loss is not sufficient enough to outweigh the cost of the sending cost someone's of depositions and courts yeah. and depending on where that is, flying them in so on and so forth. So. That doesn't give any deterrence, does it? <laughs> no, no. Um, traffic. The top three traffic crashes in the village were determined to be State Road 80 and US 441, which had 95 crashes or 22 more in 2022 than in 2021, for an increase of 30.1%. State Road 80 and Crestwood Boulevard, which had 64 crashes or 21 fewer crashes in 2022 than 21, for a reduction of 24.7%. And Okeechobee Boulevard and Royal Palm Beach Boulevard had 68 or 12 more crashes in 2022 than 2021, for an increase of 21.4%. District 9 and street crimes units, they've become a very effective tool for us as received from the notifications I sent by and through the village manager just last week alone. They were conducting a covert patrol in one of our neighborhoods where they caught some kids out there pulling on car handles. Um, after we locked everything down, got an eagle and, and our police canine, we managed to arrest them. The, the street crimes unit is something that's paid off very well for us. They're very flexible. They investigate narcotics, residential burglaries, anything we need them to do. That being said, in 2022, they made 224 arrests, resulting in 132 felony and 82 misdemeanor charges. They also made 39 warrant arrests. They conducted 1,392 traffic stops, issued 410 citations, 946 warnings, and 307 field interview reports. They authored and executed eight search warrants and assisted with an additional six others. Our District 9 detectives, together they were assigned 224 <coughs> cases, made 41 arrests, and had a case clearance rate of 43.75%. Historically, the national clearance rate for detectives, 19.7%. Something I want to thank you for, LPR cameras. Yeah. <coughs> LPR cameras were introduced, as you know, into the village of Royal Palm Beach in 2022. While some adjustments and improvements are still being made, the system detected 26 vehicles that were stolen or used in other crimes, both in and outside of the village. As you know, just this week alone, it detected a stolen vehicle that pulled into the 7-Eleven or Oakshow Boulevard in Wildcat Way. We arrested people in the car. We found narcotics and a whole bunch of other stuff. This, this thing is paying off in dividends. Um, kudos to the village manager, Chris Marsh, and his staff for you know, bringing this up online and assisting with us. It's, it's an invaluable tool. I also thank you. Quality survey. As a means by which to gauge the public satisfaction with the services rendered by District 9 deputies, surveys were mailed to 480 people who requested our assistance. Of those, only 37 responded. Of those, 94% rated us as excellent, while 3% rated us as good, and 3% as unsatisfactory. Here I have some of our goals. <coughs> Crime reduction through public awareness, officer presence and criminal investigations remains a priority. Keeping the crime in the village as well as we possibly can is obviously at the top of that. Additionally, traffic safety and obedience to traffic laws remains important to us. Only statistics in indicate that traffic crashes in the village are up and traffic enforcement has been focused on addressing that issue. And for example, this year in, in 2023, I had our criminal intelligence analyst do an analysis of our five highest crash intersections. Uh, of 
bring in some hours. I put some overtime deputies out there and uh, just ran Operation Safe Driver for two months, and we saw a dramatic decrease in the traffic at those intersections. Um, I'm waiting for the public report on that, which I'll forward to the village manager. I'm sure he'll send it to me. Is it your observation that the cause of the crashes is this, you know, people not paying attention or yes, speeding or something like that? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I could, I could tell you, going back, it's, it's rear ending, it's side angles, it's stuff like that. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, before I move on to questions, I'd like to make a few comments. It's not with great pride that I come in here and say that our crime index is up. However, I will tell you this is not unique to the village of Royal Palm Beach. It's been seen in surrounding communities, both in Palm Beach County, through the state of Florida, and across the nation. A lot of what we're seeing in the village of Royal Palm Beach has to do with recidivism. There are some of the same kids that we've caught, but because of the arrest, don't involve violent felonies, they're released again, they come back in. I also believe and have evidence to believe, because we've been told and over this in the past, and this is a good thing, but it doesn't always work to our favor. The people that live in the village of Royal Palm Beach feel very safe, and they should. But with safety, sometimes comes complacency. People say, hey, you know what, I'll be okay leaving my car in the driveway with this in the back, no one's gonna bother it, and then some kids come through a sporadic neighborhood and they find <coughs> the car and they open it. Um, a lot of what we see are things that we're addressing Sometimes, like I said, they're, they're just problems that exist here and everywhere else. Um, as far as the aggravated assault and stuff, those are things that we see. They happen inside homes. The, the police really can't do anything them as far as proactive is concerned, but reactive. So please know that what's happening here is not unique to the village. It's still a very safe place to live, work, and visit. Um, I do my best to assure that. So do my deputy, so do Sheriff Bradshaw. But like I said, this is not just us. With that, I'll open the floor up any questions. Questions? Anyone? I have a couple. Go ahead. Um, thank you for this report. You all, you, you and your team do such a great job. And um, while some statistics are up, some are down. But I think it's important also to understand that even if one particular incident went up, our population has increased. And, and so to keep that in context with where we were five years ago with where we are now, I think is really important for your team too. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Anyone else? No? Fewer murders is good. No murders is good. Very good. <laughs> well, yes, sir. Is, it is. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, so, Captain, do you, do you have any, any sense of a reason for the trend that we're seeing? I mean, there, there, there's, uneducated view of violence seems to be increasing in our nation as a whole is there is yes there? sir you know the roads are becoming more crowded people are more in a rush to get to places they're less willing to wait they want to cut in front of other people it leads to the road rage incidents the same thing has to do with aggravated assaults and, and some of the things we're seeing the property crimes i think are going to remain what they are sometimes it's just complacency but i think some of the other things we're starting to see are, are indicative of what's going on Thank you. And I, I will tell you that the uh, uh, creating opportunities for theft um, can be as innocent as just forgetting to close your garage door. And, and I have come out in the morning on a couple of occasions. Wide open. It was <laughs> wide open. And you know, it, it's funny you should mention that. And I don't want to believe in my presentation. I know that, you know, we have other things to deal with here. But part of what I didn't say, and I guess it merits bringing up, my deputies do go through neighborhoods, and when they soon see garage doors open, they do knock on doors and tell people to come and close. Okay, and there's a lot of other things I've done here to address with crime. Some I can't speak about because I have to do with technological and, and surveillance efforts. I, I could tell you that I've taken my street team and I've broken them up to the point where they have two guys working certain days of the week, another two guys working another certain days. My our analyst Harry Hook tells us what the peak crime days are for vehicle burglaries and other things, and we assign people that way. Um, right now, our minimums to, for patrol at night. I've done everything. Captain, thank you. wonderful report. And um, I think the right context is uh, there are things going on across the country. And um, I always uh, share with folks that at the end of the day, uh, crime can be ubiquitous. It can happen any day, any place at any time. And, 
Um, and I think you're right. Uh, we're used to being in a safe environment, and you kind of just fall into a pattern sometimes. You don't block things that you should. And I'm not saying we should scurry and do that, but we should just keep that in, in mind, and, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we appreciate the job you're doing, and um, I don't, I don't, don't give away your secrets. <laughs> no, sir. But I know you got a lot of things going on out there where you are being proactive. Yes, sir. Uh, and I know we are seeing results from that, that proactivity of, of uh, addressing crime potentially that can happen in the village. So with that, we thank you and continue to do the wonderful job you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're fortunate. Um, we have uh, outstanding uh, police protection, and we also have outstanding firefighter support and protection as well. So I just want to acknowledge you. I know we'll probably be getting an update from you down the road, but um, I think that's part of what makes uh, Royal Palm Royal Palm. So I think the citizens do appreciate that in both cases. So with that, we'll move on to agenda item R2, which is a public hearing to consider application number 23-040, an application by Crossroads R2G owner LCC, an adoption of resolution number 23-16. The applicant is seeking modification to a council imposed condition. They, like, they, they call it an MCIC. <laughs> uh, to amend the timeline for the installation of required public art for a property located at 1180 Royal Palm Beach Boulevard. Gee, is that the new Publix? That's Sounds like the, it. <laughs> the new and approved Publix, okay. Um, so with that, um, I guess we'll hear from our public arts person. And Mr. Mayor, while he's getting that ready, if I could swear in the applicants and ask for ex parte Yes, disclosures. I'm sorry. This is a quasi-judicial process. That's fine. Thank you, sir. Can you state your names for the record? Jana Loda with Holland and Knight. Thank you. Sonia Henney with RPT Realty. Thank you. Can you raise your right hands for me? Do you both swear from just tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. And I'll turn back to the council and ask for ex parte disclosures on this item. Nine to manager. Thank you very much. Good evening, Council Mayor. Give me one second. I'm pulling up the application. My presentation here. So I have an application before you. Uh, it's 23-040 MCIC. Can you see it there? Yeah. Um, the applicant is Crossroads R2G, owner LLC. Um, and behalf of them is Lona. Is that how you say your name? The applicant is requesting modification to council imposed condition, MCIC, to amend previously approved condition 2B to provide additional time for the installation of the art and public places requirement for the project. Due to timing constraints associated with the earlier than anticipated completion of the public's renovation, the owner has requested additional time to receive approval for commission and install the public art piece, which is being created by an international artist Wenqing Chen overseas. The proposed modification will extend the timeline for installation of the public art piece to six months from the date of council approval of the MCIC. Um, what you have in front of you uh, is special language that we're using, which is for the MCIC. It's the Yard and Public Places Requirement in Section 26-75.5 of the Village Code must be met. The public art requirement for this project is 1% of the total vertical construction costs using a certified cost estimate equivalent to 53785 The art installation shall be in the location depicted on the site plan, and this is a strike-through language, installed prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy, and the underlying language is within six months of the date of Village Council approval of application number 23 dash 040, the MCIC. Uh, recommended action by the staff. The staff has recommended approval of application number 23-040, MCIC, <coughs> through adoption of resolution number 23-16. And I would also like to mention the applicant has agreed to a condition of approval 
to bond twice the fee for the public art requirement. What was that again? Yeah. <laughs> I think, <laughs> so I think maybe Mitty can help me out. <laughs> the legal language. Very good, Mario. Very good. Um, so what was discussed with Miss Loda, and she can chime in too, but I had a conversation with her both yesterday and today. But um, in the event that there would be a default, in the event that this does not get completed in this six months, should the council grant that additional six months, the discussion was for, for the project to bond the artwork and bond it at a price of two times the value of the artwork so that the village would be able to purchase and install the artwork in the event of default. So it's my understanding, and she can certainly uh, weigh in, but that that's a, an agreed to condition. But again, she can speak more to that. But that was the intent behind the recommended condition. OK, that explains that. Are you f finished your presentation? Yeah. Yeah, I'm finished. Applicant, Mike, you say any comments? Yes, if I may. And I'll be brief, because sure. I want everybody to be able to get home for the Panthers game, in case you're <laughs> going to be rooting for the Florida Panthers, which I am. Okay. Uh, once again, Jana Loda with Holland and A on behalf of the owner, uh, Crossroads R2G owner. Uh, I have a brief presentation, and again, I'm going to fly through it just to give you a little bit more of a background context of kind of how we found ourselves here today. Um, so real quickly, and hopefully I think I've got it up, I hope, as he's coming around. Um, as he's coming around, uh, as you all may remember, back in June of 2021, um, we were before you for the a number of applications seeking to reconstruct the almost 30-year-old Publix at Crossroads with a new, much larger prototype Publix. And I have to say, I've been getting progress photos throughout, and it's going to be amazing. Um, but in connection, um, and just hopefully I'm doing this right. Let's see here. There we go. Here's the, uh, the rendering that you saw back in 2021 of the new Publix that was going to be constructed in Crossroads. I'm sure you all are familiar from driving by and looking across Village Hall. Uh, you, you're seeing that it's very near to completion at this time. Um, at that time in uh, 21, um, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. OK. Um, the resolution 21-11, which approved the site plan amendment, and did include a condition to be that required compliance with the village's art in public places uh, to the tune of 1% of the total construction costs, which, as um, Mario just indicated, was approximately $53,000, to be located at the northeast corner of Okeechobee and Royal Palm, where you see the yellow star here. Mm -hmm. um, this, I think, is the final piece of art that will complete that corner, um, all four corners, having art already in place. Um, the condition, as Mario indicated, required that the artwork be approved and installed prior to certificate of occupancy. Um, we're finding ourselves here tonight because we are getting very, very close. I think they're actually applying for their TCO as we speak. Um, and late last year, it became apparent, based upon the speed of the construction, that we felt that we were going to have an issue based upon a number of factors. So just real quickly, I just want to provide a little bit of a timeline of kind of the efforts that our client took to satisfy this requirement, um, and then again, why we find ourselves here today. Um, taking you back to August of 2021, before the building even came out of the ground, um, our client had commissioned a piece of art that was going to be a phrase, uh, indicative of the time, so to speak, like a BU, similar to like the love sculpture that you see in Philadelphia, which was presented to staff, not really warm and fuzzy, of uh, wanting something more that was indicative <laughs> of the village, something you know, we thought maybe Tree City. Regardless, that didn't pan out. Uh, then further discussions ensued, and we learned of Sachi Art, which is a large um, art gallery, online art gallery that represents a number of artists across the world. Um, identified an artist, Wengen Chen, in China, had a number of pieces, started that discussions with Sachi, only to learn that they, at that time, we're not amenable to a conditional contract, which is a requirement of the village code that the contract has to be conditioned upon the village council approval, of course. Um, so to reserve the piece, that was not something that they were willing to do. Couple that with the fact that the piece, which we thought was av available just to purchase, still had to be fabricated. Couple that with the fact that shipping from China is two months after fabrication. Couple that with the speed, as you can tell, that the Publix has gone up since August to be completion. We had to pivot. 
So late last year, I started discussions with staff as to how we might move forward. Um, we offered to bond the project. We offered to give the money to the village. We, you know, basically started looking then for a local artist. Um, so we, we basically retained Robert Fierre, who actually designed the Aldi warehouse piece to design a piece for the corner. Okay. Um, and we submitted an application in January um, with actually this piece here. It was called Eternity. Um, went to TSR in February, but I think that the fact that Mr. Fear had already provided a piece in the village, and obviously Wengenshin pieces are very kind of unique. We, we, they wanted, the staff really was recommending that we try to go back to Wengenshin. So the last few, which we are happy to do, Again, this is something that's your corner. We want you all to be happy. Sure. So we pivoted and have been negotiating with Sachi Art, which is one thing I mentioned to Ms. Bernard, is that as a condition for them making it a conditional contract, we have to pay them 100% of the artwork upon approval within 10 days. There's no phasing, no waiting for the item to be delivered and installed. We're paying the full amount within 10 days of approval of whatever artwork that you select ultimately. Um, just so you all know, just to give you flavor, this is the piece of Wang and Chen. It's a series of six, so it will be fabricated. It's called um, Growing Number Three. This is a front view on the left, a side view on the right. It's about 11 feet tall. It is a stainless steel on stainless steel um, sculpture that we're going to be commissioning from the artist Wang and Chen from China. So, um, as we were discussing this pivot. Um, it was recommended that we approach the council to amend the condition of approval um, to basically have it to give us more time to allow us to pursue this piece from China. Um, we're waiting for the signed contract to make our resubmittal. Um, I will tell you in all honesty that when we made the MCIC and, and we're still working with Sachi, I thought six months might be enough. It likely will be. be <laughs> it likely will be. <laughs> Because we, we still have to go through the village process, and then we yeah. have four months from approval. We, so we've had experience with things coming to us yeah. from China, which is why we were happy to we're happy to propose the <laughs> performance bond. We indicated at the very beginning of the process that we were happy because it has always been our commitment to satisfy this requirement. It's not a matter of, of trying to avoid that at all, okay. um, and we want to provide whatever assurances. And I know, I've, again, I've spoken with Ms. Bernard because we are going to be making this 100% payment up front. So we just would want to make sure that, you know, as long as we're pursuing this with all due diligence, that we're not found in default considering we will have basically paid for the piece of artwork. Uh, but in any event, um, that's really why we find ourselves here today. So hopefully um, that provides you a little bit more background as to why we're here. Um, hopefully um, you understand that public's is kind of very specific with respect to the requirements to, to open. They will open on a TCO, but they will not stay open for very long on a TCO. So we are endeavoring to make sure that we have no issue ultimately receiving okay. the CO for them. I just have a question. Now this picture we're looking at, this is the this is it? Well this is this is the, the, the piece of art from Wang and Chen right now that we've selected that's within the price range. From staff's perspective, why are you insisting that they go back there instead of with another artist? Yeah. Well, it wasn't more. It wasn't insisting necessarily with that. That was a piece that we liked more than the prior piece that was. Uh, so we didn't want to put them in a position where we don't like this one too. Look for someone else, right? So we didn't want to open the door to that more time going by as they're selecting somebody else. So the they provided us with different. Uh, so it wasn't this piece. It was other pieces from this artist, and this is a pretty renowned um, international public artist, so his work is <laughs> sort of different countries around the world, so we figured, you know, to bring sort of that quality of art back to the village. And so when this piece was presented, we said, well, this is more so, you know, what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Actually, it was uh, from the applicant then. Are you okay with um, giving the money to the village and then the village, if I understand correctly, and then the village choose the artwork and have it installed? No. That's not what or you're, you're not saying, saying that? That's not what you're saying. At, at the beginning, before we started this whole process, to when we pivoted to the local artist, right. we wanted to do, again, we know it's your 
corner your artwork. And so we, we were happy to give you the money at that time, have you put it into a fund, bond it, whatever, to assure the village that this was going to be done. And if, if you all wanted to take ownership of picking something, we just want the village to be happy at the end of the day. And I have to say, I mean, staff has been very forthcoming in terms of providing their input and within and you know strictly applying the art in public places because we know it's an important initiative to the village. So we certainly appreciate every all the input that they've given us. At the end of the day, we just want to make sure we give you what you want, and we also give you a Publix <laughs> that's open. We want our Publix back. That's I know. For sure. I know. Well, okay. So are we, this artwork that we're looking at, if we <coughs> agree to provide this, this request, are we saying yes to this? The P and D guy? It has to go through a process. And just one. One more clarification to that. It, they're not certified in TSR. There's resubmittal required. So they're right. still going through the TSR right. process. They're not out of that okay. yet. Yes, if I may clarify, we, we basically we're at the point where we need to resubmit with the new proposed okay. artwork from Saatchi Art with all, you know, with their contract and everything else. In, and then we'll go to a new TSR and then hopefully enter the public hearing So process. let me see if I understand something you said earlier on in your presentation. There's these artists out there who don't care whether or not it's approved, they still want to get paid? No, originally Saatchi, the, the, one of the requirements of, and because I know Mario is very, very specific to make sure any agreement that we enter, the, the village ordinance requires you to provide the contract with the artist. Right. Because the village has the ultimate decision on whether or not the art is accepted, right. any agreement with the artist has to be conditioned upon the village approval. Right. Um, Saatchi did not want to basically reserve the art because it could then get sold out from underneath us without basically they didn't want to have that condition in there they didn't want to have to wait okay. so um, now they'll they'll wait enough until as long until the approval but then yeah, we have to give still, them 100% of the money still, yeah so okay this art arena is getting interesting I just want to yeah I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I believe that too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the nuances more, more. are becoming yeah. clearer <laughs> Okay, anything else you'd like to add? No, sir, uh, that's any other it. questions from members of the council? Before we do that, then yeah. let me just find out that we have any public comments. Any advanced comments on agenda item R2? No, Mayor. Ray, any hands raised on agenda item R2? Oh, yes. So we have. Okay. Yeah, I can give you an update if you'd like. Uh, uh, when we yeah. finish this you, you, business. When you, when, let us know when you're going to have an unveiling or something, exactly. some kind of ceremony. About Excellent. That. I'll do okay. that. Um, I don't have any comment cards submitted on agenda item R2. Is anyone here would like to comment since we're talking about art? If not, I'll close public comments then on agenda item R2. <laughs> any further comments and questions from members on council? Yeah, I'm curious. <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious about local. Like, was not that a consideration? Yes, that's a good question. I believe that, and I, I unfortunately, Mr. Ortner's not here. The very first artist the, with the BU, I think is what it was being proposed initially, was was a USA artist. It might not have been a local artist. <laughs> uh, but it, I, I, I think it might have been a New York City artist, to be honest. Um, let me, I think it was an artist group. Yeah, yeah because I th cause only because I know Mr. Ortner's based out of New York City, so right. that may have been from that area. Um, and then, as I said, there was just a lot of discussion because as, as a person, as the entity trying to basically proffer the art, we, we're looking for input from staff. We know staff is somewhat restricted in what they can really give us back. Um, so, as I said, we landed on the Saatchi, and it may have been the village that actually, or our client, I'm not well, sure. Well, what, what I but, suggested was Saatchi because it was a platform to purchase art, right? So, instead of creating a mission, yeah. and sure. the, the idea was... Let's crunch down the time. So instead of commissioning and getting an artist and finding, this is a platform that hosts artists throughout the country, internationally, great public art. And so that was the idea. Mm -hmm. And then we landed on Wen King Chen. And so we were all, kind of all meshing together with that. But that's, that's how we got to that place. Okay. So 
is Saatchi the artist? It's that a platform. It's, a, it's platform. like a, So it's are like we saying, paying the platform? Saatchi is a broker. They basically yeah. are like a broker for artists. It's like a platform which, where brokers... They're like... An, <laughs> right. It, they're, a, they're a site. Okay. They're a site that hosts different artists. I will, I will tell you, Vice Mayor, in the process, yeah. before we landed on Mr. Fierre, I mean, I spoke with the head of the, the cultural arts for Palm Beach County, Broward right. County, everything tried, and I learned more about this whole area. <laughs> and I learned one what, thing what is that most, art, learn, most right? artists won't do any conceptual design or ideas for you without being paid. Right. That's yes. the first thing I learned. So, so the, I, I've learned a lot about this whole process. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> that's where Mr. Fierre, I mean, I tell you, he jumped okay. right into the fray, so I give him credit. Um, yeah, but, he's great. So, so as, as much as we can going forward on projects, we would love to have local artists as much as we can. Of course. And I, I don't want to be the dead horse. Whatever but local means, but yeah. <laughs> as well, well, they started with local artists. Yeah. 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 They weren't there. There'll be, there'll be other, I'm sure there'll be other opportunities, so we'll see. Right. Yeah, you done? Any, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, yeah. actually. So, Mitty, this is a question for you. Can you simplify what are our options here? Because I think I heard three different things. So we can do, can you just clarify? So you, what are we being asked? asked what are we being tonight? asked? Yeah. Correct. Your, your, the application before you is to provide the additional six months, and it's not from... Any other time but your approval tonight. So if granted by the council tonight, it would be to approve and grant that additional six months from today. Okay. The condition that Mario put out was that, that the to bond. So. Contemplate a pay. The bonding is just in place in the event of default, right? So you can approve, deny, approve with conditions. Those are your three in terms of your your, your formal action. Those are your three options. Okay. Um, so then if we are making conditions or options or anything, would there be an opportunity then, and I don't want to take anything away from, from anybody, but if it were basically just saying, here's twice the value, village, you go find something that you want and put out there. They're already in the process. Okay. Your code doesn't really contemplate that. Your code contemplates an applicant-driven right. purchase installation. Right. So I, I think that's going a bit outside the code. Okay. They're currently in the process, so you will certainly get, and the Public Art Advisory Board will get a recommendation on the project. That's a separate application. This is really just to give them more time. Okay, and then six months starts from tonight from or tonight. tomorrow morning. Yeah, correct. It, okay. I think the way it's worded is from the date of your approval, okay. which will be tonight. Okay. okay. Thank you. And just to add on to that, if if we were, and I'm not saying I recommend that, but if we were to do what Selena was suggesting, then we the village would then have to take care of that art, right? And we don't we don't want that. No, we don't want that. We want that. Well, I wasn't thinking. Uh, you're thinking from the maintaining standpoint. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't thinking the maintaining. I was thinking of just doing this. Of look, give it, uh, put it in our hands. We'll find something and put it in there. But they're still responsible for everything else. I was just saying. Uh, yeah, that's I, an option instead of going back and forth. Yeah. But we're we're already midway through the process. We, but yeah, we're downstream in the process, and this, believe it or not, it's still relatively a new process for us. Right. And we'll just let's just move this along. And what we're really, yeah, I think, the question is, can we give them an extension? And they understand that they will only get a temporary CO. Right. And I think the the, uh, the any problems that may come up, I think the remedies are already been kind of said. Um, just just to clarify two things. One is my understanding is that the CO will be able to be issued with this um, amendment, number one. And number two, I just want to clarify that. And number two, um, I'm just putting it out there. I understand it may not be possible, in which case we may be before you with another MCIC, whether or not we could get eight months versus six months because of what I previously explained with the timing of getting through the village approval. Once we submit, it's probably three to four months to get through the village, assuming we can get maybe three months if we get with, through one TSR. So, but I, I understand that may not be possible because of how it was advertised, but I just put that out there. If not, I'm just putting a pin in there that we may be back because we certainly never want to be in default and have to have to pull on that bond. Right, you, any insights on this you want to share with us? Um, 
<laughs> we know the reality of that. Yeah. So I think the, the way that this was advertised was for the six months. So public notices went out, legal yeah. ads went out. So right. to to do anything beyond that would require, as she said, an additional MCIC down the road. It's not to say you couldn't, it would just be another modification to your, your new count, imposed condition from tonight. So you could do that, but it would require another application, another approval. I, 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 yeah, to that extent, I don't think we have to say that we were looking to erect another request for extension if it came about. If it came about, well, of course that bridge is going to happen. So. And you look we're going to work, work very hard to still no, no, make no. it. We, and we understand. <laughs> we're, we're trying to stay within the confines of the rules. Appreciate. We have to operate under. So. And we will get it through TSO. We'll, we'll get it through TSO. Yeah. So I think yeah. <coughs> that's not an issue. That's not a contract. Yeah. So there should not be there should any delays, delays there. there. And yeah. We've been working very closely with Mario on that. This so is, we appreciate that with staff. That slow boat is what's. <laughs> And and we're all and then we're all in the same spot. Just to make then. sure it's not yeah. one of the containers that falls off the ship. <laughs> Please don't. Yeah. Please. What is your? Um, are you still looking to open up the end of June? I believe or middle of June. My understanding is is that they were in today. I I, I checked with our our project manager. They're they're looking to get the TCO now. Once they get to TCO, I believe that's when they can start to stock, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then hopefully very quickly thereafter they'll get the CO. And right. I'll make sure that invites go out to everybody. I'm sure uh, you're thinking three opening. to four weeks. <laughs> yeah, let, yeah, give us some advance notice. Yes. And I think it should be a nice. I'll let opening. Sonia Henny come up. That's why I was asking. Yes. Sorry. I emailed them today to get information on when the grand opening is. Okay. So you're some... thinking three to four weeks from today. Yeah, I'm thinking within the month. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we all get asked a lot. I'm sure. Yes. Good, right? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's anticipation out there, definitely. <laughs> Sorry, one more, one more question. Sorry, when the the piece of art is arrives, mm -hmm. who will install it, and how long will it take? Um, it's part of our work to actually build the foundation, the lighting that will go with it, because it will be lit. I think from dusk to midnight. If, if I um, can interject, yeah. that all of those considerations will go under TSR. Yes. So before any, we know what the work is: foundation, installation, lighting. That like previous. Um, I uh, think we've voted on that will also go through TS the whole round of TSR so TSR uh, public art advisory board and then it'll go through the board. I understand yeah. it doesn't answer my question oh. <laughs> <laughs> we're responsible it, the, the product as I understand it, it will be delivered and then it's 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 made to be automatically fastened to like bolts that will be fashioned in the foundation and so the foundation work, the lighting work, all that will be permitted through the village. And when it arrives, it's, it's a pretty quick install at that point. Terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, comments? If none, I'll look for a motion to approve. We're making a, uh, I'm asking the question. I'm not doing it. We're making a motion to approve the extension of the six months for the artwork with the, cat, with the addition of the bond and uh, right that could be that could be a condition of your condition your motion of, right okay. of, I just want to make sure that that's now that we've talked a lot about so. and it's a TCO not a CO they actually they'll get a they'll get a TCO but they actually can get a CO this this is changing the the current condition that is in your resolution requires the art to be installed before issuance of the CO this changes it to it must be installed within six months of your approval tonight so they will get a CO the art just has to go in within six months of tonight should you approve it. Okay. Are you okay with that? You want to make a motion? You asked the question? I asked the question. Don't get the motion. Okay. If we understand what the motion needs to be in a condition of, of approval, who wants to make a motion? I'll make the motion for uh, to approve regular agenda item R2. Do we have to include the condition? The yes, is the maker of the motion including the condition to to bond the art at two times the value, which is a value of one hundred and seven thousand five hundred and seventy dollars? With that condition, That's as stated by our attorney. Thank you. Right. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. We have one opposed. All right, Diane, let the record show that uh, agenda item R two was approved four one. 
Thank you all. Agenda item R3, the public hearing for the first reading and approval of ordinance number 1033, amending chapter 23, traffic and vehicles at section 23-16, manner of parking vehicles upon streets, public rights of way, public owned parking spaces, vacant lots and swells, penalties, which will have penalties. To clarify the swell parking restrictions within the village and add additional regulations to address parking of vehicles on public owned property. Uh, who's presenting? Well, Rob Hill, but I, I, I'll take this one. This one was presented by our community development director some time ago. It was the first hearing, uh, first reading. But what we, when we drafted this ordinance, we, we left out the restriction for the adjacent property owner not to park on the swale for more than 24 hours. So when we originally brought this to you at the first reading, we were putting restrictions on other people parking in front of your house. Right. They were allowed to park in front of your house on the street within two hours. They're not allowed to park in your swale at all, uh, but the ac actual homeowner can park in the swale for up to, uh, up to 24 hours uh, is what this new one has. And, and that's the, the only change from the first reading was that adding of that the, the adjacent property owner 24, so being be allowed to park up to 24 so hours. This so this is the first reading of the first reading. Because that was a significant change, okay, no, just, it became okay. a first reading again, yes. So there will be a second reading. There will be a second reading. Okay. Okay. I don't know. It, I know Rob is out there. If he wants to add anything more to that, he's more than welcome. Okay. Um, well, before we take comments, questions, uh, any advance public comment requests on this? Any hands raised on this one? Public comments? No, Mayor. Agenda order or three? I have no comment card submitted to me on agenda item R3, but if anyone here would like to comment, I don't think anyone here wants to comment. <laughs> so we're going to close public comment to agenda item R3, open the questions and comments from council. If there are none, I'll look for uh, a motion. Actually, I, I do because this one is stating 24 hours. I'm kind of thinking like how... How do you enforce it? No, I was actually thinking is, is that fair for our residents that you can only park in front of your property for 24 hours. I, my thought was it's the 48 hours, if not 72, because if you have, you know, guests and you're coming in and you're there for a weekend or there's an overnight, I think, I just think the 24 hours was too short. I understand enforcement might be the concern. I don't know how you really enforce that, to be honest with you, but. Yeah, and, and I don't know. I just thought that 24 hours was too short, considering it's my house, my property, and I understand I'm in the, the right of way, but. And we had that conversation, staff members, and, and you know, when the difference, the big difference between 24 hours and 48 hours, at 24 hours it has to move every day. It, so it, it, it's not a car we want people, it, it can't be stored there. When you go more than 24 hours, it all of a sudden becomes something that's, that's there for, it's stored. It's not driven every day, and that and and it is it is easier for code enforcement to keep track of a car moving every day versus every couple of days. Yeah, and then I think of Uncle Eddie who comes to visit for the holidays, and now Uncle who? Eddie. Uncle Eddie. So you have somebody who's there. You know, he's not bringing the RV, but you're there. You have guests. They were there for the week or four days. You know, now you have to say, you know what, you need to move your car every day. And now I feel like. We're opening up the village to be an HOA versus, you know, the street cleaning's coming and you have to switch sides. And I will say we have the 24 hours now, and, we, and we've had the 24 hours for many, many years, and that has not been a problem. Okay. Well, then there, there is then exceptions certain times of the year when things, or you're saying is that we haven't had. The, the cars have moved enough every day where it hasn't been a problem okay. for code enforcement or the neighbors. Okay. The neighborhood. They're, they're, they're not complaining right. about moving. Right. So I, I had another question about Eddie, too. Yeah. <laughs> Uncle Eddie. Uncle Eddie, okay. Do, we would not get into a situation where we're putting up signs or placards that say. No. Okay, good. No. No, you know what, what, what our, what our, you can't park there enough where you can't grow grass. So even if you park there every day, come to a point where you couldn't grow grass and that would be a, a different violation so we, we allow people to park there it's just supposed to be temporary yeah. not stored and once again these are for residential vehicles not commercial that's another ordinance that, that addresses 
uh, commercial vehicles. So the same limitations on commercial vehicles on your property would apply in the swale. Okay. And then they can't block the right of way, regardless, because I'm assuming then would PBSO get involved? Yeah, you cannot. You can't block the through traffic. That is correct. Okay. Because I believe there's some commercial vehicles throughout the neighborhood that are using this, but that might block right away coming through the streets. And that would narrow. be, again, a different violation that would okay. be addressed by PBSO. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? If not, I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve regular agenda R3. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, let the record show that agenda item R3 was approved 5 0. Okay. Oh, item number four. Notice how the village manager approved item number four? <laughs> <laughs> that was item to be sublineal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> item number four is the annual review, evaluation, and merit pay determination for the village manager. Um, I think I sent something out to all of you about a month or so ago to do your review and hopefully. Hopefully all of you have had an opportunity to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with the village manager and what we should be doing tonight is maybe giving a, a summary of our thoughts. And um, I guess we'll start with you, Tim. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. So you know you didn't send it. I did send it. <laughs> um, oh, there we go. Thanks. Um, you know, going through the requirements, and I'll just go through it real quick. So the, in the evaluation standards, so it's employee retention, which we do have many um, employees that have been here for 20 plus years. Poor <laughs> Diane, you're, you're pushing 38, 34, <laughs> no. 38. Yeah. Really? Yeah. No, I didn't know that. Number one. Yes. Why <laughs> <laughs> you call her out? Come on. <laughs> because, because she started when she was 12. That's why. Oh, okay. Yeah. 12. Okay. You know, image of the village and in, in, intergovernmental, um, I think we are constantly complimented on the village overall. I mean, from our peers, from uh, others. Um, long range planning, we do push you to, to do your strategic plan or your, I mean, your um, uh, long term plans and, and uh, succession plans. Financial management, we are extremely sound. Um, you know, this past year was something that we couldn't predict or control. Um, but we are very good financially sound. And I say it all the time, it's the, the councils that came, I mean, you might have been here, but it's those that came long before us that gave us this ability. Um, and we've been well managed. And, and we've, the council has managed that money over the last, since 2006, almost 20 years. Right. So we still have it. Mm -hmm. and we, right. Um, communication with the village council, I think you are very good at informing us so that we know everything. Um, completion and direction of capital projects and things like that, that um, I do find there's the timeline. We have, we put the strategic plan out. Every so often you give us the update of this is where we are and it's all color coded. Um, you and I talked about it is because I always feel that there's something that everybody can improve upon. So my gift to you is that your ability to take criticism that maybe you should improve on something is that is what I'm thinking. Because you do, I mean, I know all I'm saying, communication's always there, how you work with the staff, things get completed, they're all done in a timely fashion. Um, I said this from day one, is the longevity of our staff is a telltale sign of that. So thank you very much oh, for everything you're welcome. you um, I guess I'm pretty much in line with Selena. The criterion said rank one to five, and every one of the criteria that Selena mentioned, I would say, uh, five on, the only one he'll get knocked on for four is completion, but and we don't have village hall done, but it's it's really <laughs> going to be done. So, I mean, I understand I there's there's only so much that goes into that. Uh, I think that's been particularly well managed, honestly, and, you know, the uh, rec center is still in progress, and unfortunately, supply side, supply chain issues and all kinds of things. And for major, you know, I think
number one test. Appreciate that, but she's not people who've been here for decades. And I, I mean, sitting up here, that gives me pride that we're establishing a workplace where, you know, people appreciate it and, and enjoy working for the village. Because if, if, if it was that bad, especially in this economy, people would be leaving. I mean, there are op other opportunities out there. So um, I thank them for doing the work they do and uh, keep it up. Those are my scores. So insofar as employee relations is concerned, I think the evidence of long-term employees here certainly is, is probably one of the primary things that says good leadership creates a good environment, uh, creates good results, and, and I think that's a testimony to it, as well as is the agility to be able to adjust um, HR-wise to situations that arise and suddenly um, impact on the, the completion of uh, important activities, uh, and, and I've certainly have seen that here recently, but um, again, uh, forming a team, uh, people that really work together uh, and, and help one another, um, that's, a, that's a pretty powerful indication of some really good leadership. Uh, insofar as image is, is concerned, uh, Selena was saying, you know, that we, we all hear from other villages, other uh, communities of the county even, uh, as to how well managed uh, the village of Royal Palm Beach is. Uh, and some of the challenges of, of the dynamic environment that we're in right now and also trying to maintain that, that basic sense of an American hometown and family-oriented um, in, in the face of a very dynamic and a changing environment um, is, is one that I, I think um, puts our image at a, at a very high level. Here just recently with the, uh, the work, and this kind of slides into uh, the long-range planning that we've been doing on uh, looking forward into the future in a definitive way, not in a generic way, but something that talks about specific locations and possibilities and things of that nature. That's an incredibly solid foundation for going forward. Always remembering we're trying to maintain who we are and at the same time, and it, it's, a, it's a huge uh, challenge and a credit that we are where we are right now, looking, looking forward with some pretty clear vision of where we're headed. Um, and so far as, um, just leadership-wise in, in intergovernmental relations, uh, the fact that Ray gets called upon often, League of Cities, other places, uh, to bring his expertise in specific areas. And this, this has happened again and again and again, continues to happen, more evidence of uh, his, um, his credibility and his effectiveness uh, among his peers uh, as well. Uh, the long-range planning, I, I can't say enough about how the strategic planning process has matured. I mean, it really has. I mean, my idea of actually having a strategic plan that is the basis for formulating most of a budget uh, sounds like a blinding flash of the obvious, but the reality is very few organizations have that kind of a powerful connection. And the fact that we all come together to produce that strategic plan, uh, including uh, the citizens, again, is a testimony to, to his initiative, um, which, as I recall, it came with him. Uh, it was my very first year on the council, actually. Uh, and it has come a long way, and it's really a powerful tool. Um, financial management, uh, there are probably, I'm going to step out there and just say, there are probably no other municipalities that are in the financial condition that we are with a stable base. We talk about keeping that, that original uh, chunk of money that we got for uh, the wastewater management um, facility sale um, from 2006 uh, is, is a credit to a very, I, I would say, conservative, but... Um, very productive and appropriately um, considered financial approach. Uh, and of course, we've got the years of not having raised uh, our, our, uh, our uh, ad valorem rate, uh, pretty significant and unique. Um, capital imp improvement projects under the, <laughs> the current conditions, uh, supply chain costs, um, and the normal stuff in just doing large projects. And extraordinarily, um, significant set of accomplishments there. Uh, like everybody else, anxious for Village Hall to open up and excited about the possibilities in the rec center. And then finally, communications with the council 24-7, <laughs> whether you want it or not, 24-7. Uh, <laughs> and, and so that is very reassuring to me. It, it really is. So I, I appreciate that and, and think uh, Ray has done a genuinely outstanding job. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So I too couldn't find the email.
<laughs> All right, I will no, talk to did. Chris. I'll tell her that you guys are saying you didn't see the email. It, okay. it, it did, but I, I, I couldn't find it. So I took a different perspective, and I, I went back through the strategic plan, and I looked at our four areas. Operations, I think. I don't need it. Oh, you don't? <clears throat> Operations, I think that um, everything's been said. Great job there. Um, same with finance. Um, but, but one of the things that it hasn't been said, I think, sort of in this, in this way, is looking at community uniqueness, uniqueness and just that, just that constant looking for the future, looking to see the best in what we can do for the village, and looking at comprehensive plans for redesign of State Road 7 or the mobility plan and pulling in the, in the, you know, the transportation with the county staff and taking that leadership. Um, it's been said, but I'll repeat it. Um, your leadership outside of the village is important and it's recognized. And um, you take leadership positions on boards and committees and I think it's, it's, it's not only good for our village, but it's good for the rest of the community because they see a really good person who's doing an outstanding job. And I think that's really important for our county too. Um, and so I too asked Ray, you know, how do you think you're doing? And, and uh, he, he, he doesn't believe in those, you know, 360 evaluations, but it's okay. <laughs> and so just, just to keep him humble, my score for him is 4.95. You <laughs> yeah, finish? Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Um, I, uh, my approach to evaluating uh, individuals in senior leadership positions is, and I've done this, I don't know how long I've done this, uh, when I was working on Wall Street, but I think we, uh, I agree with all the comments you all have made, by the way, about race in general, but the big context here is uh, when you're in a leadership position for an organization, is what are the outcomes that an organization is able to achieve? Uh, are they outcomes that are uh, consistent with their, uh, their, their strategy? And we do have a strategy-driven approach to, to planning. Um, and by consistent means that it's not just creating a vision, but actually managing to that vision every day every week and every month and, and constantly asking ourselves and asking the organization are we looking to do something that's not consistent with that vision and or do we need to expand the vision or modify it and and to me uh, when you're in a senior leadership position that's a very challenging environment to to lead because you have a lot of different moving parts uh, you got external influences you got internal influences and so that's kind of the, the model I use when I evaluate senior level uh, 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 leaders. And I, I give Ray uh, an A on that, absolutely. Um, he and I talk a lot about these kind of things. And, um, and we talk about things that, you know, what decisions we made in the past and how they've manifested themselves to put us where we are today. Um, and the other thing I think you all have heard me say this, Ray hears me say this a lot, is when you're like really doing well, you know, and as I use the, the, the analogy of the football team going to the Super Bowl and winning the Super Bowl, and then next year they have to come back. Well, how do you, how do you sustain that level of excellence? And that's really, I think, one of the biggest challenges that Ray has, and that you all have too, sitting up here, is maintaining that standard of, of excellence. And I don't know about you, but I've gotten so much feedback from our citizens. They think we're, we're pretty much on the right track, and they want us to continue to, to stay on the right track. So with that, Ray, I think uh, we have a consensus that you're doing a wonderful job. What do we do now about the, the merit thing? I, 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 how do you want to handle that? I mean, are we looking? The five is what? Five percent? <laughs> what are the parameters? Well, Selena pointed out I approved five percent. <laughs> <laughs> the amount's probably in like invisible ink. <laughs> just follow the recommendation. Is that the idea? So the recommendation is a five percent lump sum deal. You don't want to you don't want it added to your, it, it, to it your is salary. Completely, it, it's a lump sum. It's not added to the salary. And That's what you would like. Correct. Correct. Okay. We know it's from zero to five percent. Is is the all right? Is so the amount. I would look for a motion then that we would grant that at the five percent level. I'll There's make a motion for that. I'll make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Any opposed?
Is that a poem? Okay. It's so consistent. Do we have? Yeah, it does. <laughs> I think it's the average poem. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard that before. The average is 5%. Well, I mean, it's 5%. No, that's no. Not, no. Everyone getting is not an average. It's the pot. No, I didn't say that. I said the average. Everybody is getting the average. The ones who get it. <laughs> you stick with that? No? Okay. Diane, let the record show that uh, the 5% merit increase, uh, which is not a salary increase, but uh, lump sum. Okay. What's the proof? 4 1. You flip flop? Modify that, that it was it was really approved 5 0. Okay. Can we do it that way, Keith? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, with that, we have no other items on the agenda this evening. Thank you all. Appreciate it. And um, we'll, we'll see, you, see you next week or whenever. You know, we got, if you haven't seen the email, we, we've got our budget hearings on the horizon. They're coming up. Yeah.